Buried next to me now is Lot Smith, probably one of the most fascinating figures in the Wild West, whose story begins in 1830. His parents were both very early converts to the LDS faith, and at only 14 years old, Lot Smith saw their prophet, Joseph Smith, and his brother Hiram killed in the Carthage jail by an angry mob. And so begins Lot Smith's life of roaming to the Wild West. He makes his way out to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and at age 16, joins the Mormon Battalion. Now this battalion was an actual regular unit of the U.S. Army, and it remains to this day the only battalion organized around a specific religion. So Lot Smith at 16 begins one of the most arduous military expeditions in all of history. They march from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to San Diego, California as a part of the Mexican-American War. Well, as soon as they get to San Diego, this battalion is sort of mustered out of service, and Lot Smith and his men, they're working at Sutter's Mill. Now at Sutter's Mill, gold was discovered and they were already in California and at the beginning it really was like gold was lining the streets. So Lot Smith returned to Utah a very, very wealthy man and thus begins his start as a military expert. Basically, at this time in Utah history, the first conflicts with the Native Americans had already begun to simmer between the Mormons and the Indians. And there had been a battle at Battle Creek, which was more of a massacre. So in 1850, Brigham Young orders the extermination of the Timpanagos tribe as a people. And Lot Smith volunteers for the Nauvoo Legion to go and do this. They arrive at Fort Utah, and in the early hours of the morning, they approach this fort of Indians this community of Indians, rather, and they fire a chain shot into them, and the survivors flee up into the canyons. Well, Lot Smith pursues them, along with men like Porter Rockwell and Wild Bill Hickman, and they kill and behead Chief Old Elk. They kill about a hundred of them who are holed up in a cabin, and they enslave 40 more, taking their heads and putting them on posts at Fort Utah. Well, they sell the head of Chief Old Elk to Jim Bridger, who runs a fort up near Wyoming, not too far from Utah, and uh, he's already considered Lot Smith an expert in military affairs, because he's been in the U.S. military, he's been in the Mexican-American War, he's a sharp man, and he's very spiritually inclined, so he quickly ingratiates himself with men like Porter Rockwell, Brigham Young, and he's an all-around socialite. Well, by 1857, the U.S. government started being wary of the Mormons, and they sent Johnson with one-third of the entire U.S. military on an expedition from Kansas to Utah. Now immediately, Brigham Young knew this would be a massacre. In fact, Johnson was anti-Mormon and they had already been persecuted and massacred in places like Hans Mill, and places like Missouri, Illinois, Ohio. There were even angry mobs in New York. You know, the first of many began in New York. So they knew that they had to fight off Johnson's army. But the Mormons were scattered and sparse around Utah territory, and Lot Smith said, Brigham, we can't fight these men directly. We have to be a nuisance to them, a thorn in their side. So Lot Smith and Porter Rockwell, rather than create direct conflict, they basically are an advanced party that goes behind them, begins burning three supply trains without injuring a single soldier in the U.S. Army, they light the grass on fire in front of them, and as night falls, they begin shooting wildly all around them, basically instilling a sense of fear in Johnson's army. And they delayed their advance long enough that they didn't enter Echo Canyon as they initially planned, which would have been a slaughter of the Mormons. They curved over to the west and went to Bridger's Fort because the winter had set in early and a blizzard had fallen on them. So this delayed the army long enough for the Mormons to make negotiations, and thanks to Lot Smith, there was no massacre. Well, as the years went on, Lot Smith was approached by Abraham Lincoln and the onset of the Civil War. Because the army hadn't really reached Utah yet, and the army that was there was kind of sparse, and they had very little work to do, he approached Lot Smith, rather than the army, and said, Lot, I need you to raise a cavalry, a battalion of cavalry, of men to patrol the telegraph wires, because the first telegraph wires went east to west in 1861, and by 1862, Indian raids were happening all across these telegraph wires, and they were worried about Confederate sympathizers, especially in the gold camps, places like Colorado, Oklahoma, and Kansas. Kansas. So they approached Lot Smith and they said, be a patrol for us. So Lot Smith actually was involved in the 1863 Bear River Massacre. 
In what sense he was involved, I don't know, but just yesterday I spoke to a man who was an expert on the subject, and he showed me some mention of it. Lot Smith seemed to be there the day after the massacre took place, and he reported that 60 white men had been killed. In reality, it was only 14 and 60 Indians. In reality, it was something they counted 495 after all was said and done. Okay, here's Hans Jasperson's um, account from his journal. As we traveled through Utah to the, uh, to, to the north end of Salt Lake, crossed the Bear River, Lot Smith came to us and said that the soldiers had been fighting the Indians up the river and the Indians had killed 60 men and wounded 60 more. Well, um, that number's not... I mean, that was Lot Smith's numbers. It's not actual history. I started to count dead Indians along the bank of the river and up the little creek. I counted 493 dead Indians, and that's not counting the ones that uh, were in, tried to get away and were jumped into the river and uh, were shot trying to escape. When I found these, I found them down at the, where the massacre ended, six inches down, and again six inches apart, the two bullets. And when I surfaced them, there were bone fragments there. And so, for evidence, I took this, but I, I uh, covered the ground back up, took the GPS coordinates, and staked it out so that if they need to go back in and do any testing or whatever, they could locate that. That was really sad. I sat down when I found those and I just cried. It's incredibly sad. Yeah. So Lot Smith was now again in another battalion attached to the U.S. military, but the history of the Utah Territory and the Civil War is very poorly understood, as well as Lot Smith's part in it, because Lot Smith's star began to fall very quickly, especially after polygamy ended. Like many other Mormon socialites, he headed down to Arizona, specifically to Tuba City, with a couple of his wives. Now, gunplay happened there. He ran the Circle S Ranch, but he was a cattle rancher. So these guys wanted him to move off of his land so they could take it. So their basic idea was to provoke him into a fight so that when he went to go pull his pistol, they could get the draw on him. So they walked up to him while he was at his stables with his two sons, and they began poking and prodding him into a frenzy. So he walked over to his house to retrieve his gun, and one of the bad guys says, you know, shoot him, shoot him. But his accomplice says, I refuse to shoot a man in the back. Well, Lot Smith comes out and he sees them with their hand like this, and he says, basically, there's a gunfight, but it's diffused, and neither of these men are injured, nor is Lot Smith or either of his two sons. So, the basically, the guys who tried to get him to shoot so that they could kill him, they went to the law and said, Lot Smith, not only does he have two wives, but he tried shooting us. But Lot Smith was such a great guy that he had befriended all the local law enforcement, and they said, you're on his land, and so what if he has two wives? We're not doing anything about it, because he's a good enough guy, leave him alone. And so Lot Smith was left alone up until 1892, when he was killed in a conflict. Basically, some of the local Native Americans, he was living in Tuba City, which is now the heart of the Hopi Reservation, but the local Navajo and Hopi, some of them wanted to start a war with the Mormon settlers, because as the Mormons came in to proselytize, other ranchers came in to grab up land, and they viewed men like Lot Smith as responsible. So Lot Smith, with his milk cow operation, every time that he would graze his cows, he would see that they have ripped a hole into his wire fence, and they've let their herds of sheep in. Generally, the white settlers were cow operators, or, or you know, cattlemen, and the Native Americans were sheep herders. So he would go shoo the sheep back, and then the Navajo, he could literally see them at the edge of his property with blankets, shooing them back onto his property. Now, the reason this conflict is so long going, there were a dozen sheep wars, is because the sheep overgraze and their teeth are sharper, so wherever they eat, cattle have nothing left to eat when they go in, and Lot Smith's cattle were starving. So finally, Lot Smith has had enough, and he said, if you don't leave, I'm gonna go get my gun. So they shooed their sheep right back on his property and said, what are you gonna do, old man? Lot Smith went inside and began shooting the sheep 
that came back on his property. Well, the Navajo and Hopi responded in turn by shooting a couple of Lot Smith's cows. Finally, Lot Smith was mad enough and he said, you know, my wife doesn't want me dying out here. I'm going back to my cabin. So as he goes back to his cabin, he is shot in the back by a local Hopi as well as another, it's conjectured, possibly a white settler shot Lot Smith in the back. They don't really know who killed him. And he was buried for a decade on his property down there in Tuba City, Nevada, uh, Tuba City, Arizona, but he was still seen as a beloved figure in the entire community. The plan to start a war between settlers and Indians did not work in the 1890s. In fact, his funeral had a huge crowd of mourning Native Americans, and the Mormons were incredibly sad. They said, you are to say nothing and do nothing because we don't want to upset the Native population. The Mormons' policy was say nothing, do nothing. Well, in 1902, his body was exhumed and brought back up here to Farmington, and his status as a Mormon folk hero is, I, I feel that he should have even more recognition perhaps than Porter Rockwell. He's a fascinating, fascinating character, and he was with this church from beginning to the turning point of the 1890s.